sorry about that class seem as if i had a um, interruption of my signal so are you hearing me now yes sir loud and clear okay sorry about that. so let's um wrap up the blunt trauma so very important that we look at the mechanism of injury as it relates to the car versus the motorcycle. And we say that the rider will travel at high unstopped by a stationary object, another vehicle or road jar. And so they can sustain severe abrasion, which we say that the protective clothing they will wear will help with this part of it, but it's not going to prevent them from sustaining serious injury. Are another bear that in mind that you still will have to look at the mechanism of and all of the collision that we talk about as it will persons in the vehicle will occur also motor car versus the car the car. So a controlled crash mechanism that some riders will do, and we say especially the professional riders, they will use this techniques where they try to separate themselves from the body of the motor. So whenever they are about to crash, they will try to get themselves on the opposite side of the motorcycle from the impact point so that they don't get crushed between, between their motorcycle and the vehicle that they are going to collide into. So that's what they call a control crash. So they are trying to minimize the amount extent of the impossible to save their lives. So you will also look at that when you assess your patient. So we are looking at falls now. So fall, we say, is another mechanism where you can sustain blunt force trauma. And we said from potential energy is that your, the person will be there, the object will be there. Once they start to fall, then the potential energy convert to kinetic energy. And that is dependent on the distance they fall to. So just how you look at the speed as it relates to a motor vehicle crash, the height that a person falls to is directly related to the amount of injury that they sustain, the extent of the injury. So we said for it to be significant for an adult, it is over 12 feet, 6 meters. Once a person as an adult fall from a height of more than 12 feet, 20 feet, then you are going to say that's significant and they can have significant multi system trauma. For the child, we say it is over 10 feet. Don't think of the child having to fall more than 20 feet for it to be significant. As, as low as 10 feet, the child can sustain significant mechanism of injury. So, internal injury poses the greatest threat to life. And that is where we say the same. Three collisions gonna be occurring here. They are gonna be falling, they're gonna hit on the surface, and so that kind of energy transfer to work and gonna cause injury to their body. Wherever the impact, that's the second collision. The organ inside gonna be moving at the same speed relative to that kind of energy that they develop falling, and so it's gonna cause the internal organ to crash also against the internal part of the body. But recognize that wherever they land and so the, the height is the most significant part of the equation as it relates to the injury pattern but also the object they fall on the surface they fall on and what part of their body is impacted and that will also determine the injury that they sustain so three things you're looking at height of the fall which we say is the number one thing which is directly related to the extent of the injury but also consider that the object, the, the surface they land on, and also the area of the body that they fall on will contribute also. So patients who fall and land on their feet may have less severe internal injuries. Their legs may have absorbed much of the energy of the fall. But remember that you can have indirect forces being transferred from the foot all the way up to the Tip feed area, the femur, the pelvic, you can also have spinal in all the way up to your lumbar spine. 
So they fell on their are they calcaneus? Don't suspect that. Don't tell yourself that they don't have injuries further up. So that's your index of suspicion again. Mechanism of injury, you use it as a guide and suspect the possible injuries and always think the worst. Suspect spinal injury because we say that this is a significant mechanism of injury. Go ahead, Mr. Manning. Yes, sir, I'm just curious. Um, because as you mentioned, when you know falling on the legs um may reduce some injuries but it may cause spinal injury so basically it's i don't know if there's like a safe way to fall if, if there's such a thing you'd say like drop on roll or something like that that would be the best option because it turns out like no matter how or how or high you fall from or where you land you're gonna sustain some injury that may cause some devastating effect so what, what would your part take be on that so so what you're saying you're gonna try to break your fall so if you can do that yes it will minimize it because again we say it all depends on time you take change from one or uh, one velocity to the so just in the motor vehicle accident if you gradually slow it then you might not sustain any injury or minimal injury so the same thing with the fall if you can break that fall Lengthen the time that it takes for you to hit the surface wherever you're landing, and then it will help, and you will absorb force over a wider area of your body if you can break it. So that's all part of the mechanism. Here. But you had a question, Mr. Johnson? All right. Um, yes, moving along. Moving on. Hello? You had a question? Yes, sir. Um, so, with um, as you said, money in a sense, you break your fall, you see? Um, you can break your fall within a certain height, but, what you say, over, what, 10 feet? Uh, 20, 20. Yes, that's what we are saying. Um, if you can, then it will minimize it. But if you can't, then that's the, the whole point. The, energy, the kind of energy will gonna transfer into work, and that's going to result in the injury. So if you can, it will help. But if you can't, then you know that all of that will going to be transferred to work on the body, and it's going to result in injury. So it says here that the height of the fall is a critical part of the type of surface you strike and the part of your body that first then determine the extent of the injury. So all three components are important, but the most significant one is the height that you fall to. Mm -hmm. So right, that, the, yes. The, so the, that the height of the fall may result in some penetrating trauma because the knee or the the, the hip in the pelvic there now go can withstand the, 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 the contact force when you hit the surface so the, 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 the bones and the thing that will pierce through the skin yeah well well we, we're moving on to another section of trauma so we're going on to penetrating trauma so that that's not the fall would mainly be blunt force trauma. So yes, you can and might have penetrated trauma, but more so you're gonna have the blunt force trauma. So what you need to recognize as we finish off the blunt force trauma is that the forces, the mechanism of injury is what you look at first, and based on the mechanism of injury, where the force is applied to the body, where the force is applied to the car or the motorbike, then you will have an index of suspicion of whatever force is applied to the body and what structures and organs can be injured. And the potential is that you can have hidden injuries from a third collision and also the second one. So you have to know your anatomy and be mindful of those injuries. Yes, Miss Wellington.
Miss Wellington left the, the room. She's not asking a question, so continue. Okay, so we're moving into penetrating trauma. So this we say is when the object are forced applied at a narrow point of contact to the body, resulting in the skin and penetrating injury to the body. And the danger we say is that internal organs can be damaged, internal bleeding likely, external bleeding, and also contamination. So second leading cause of trauma death after blunt trauma, and it can occur from accidental impalement, or it can be intentional by a knife, ice pick, or other object, or other weapon. So it can be accidental as well as deliberate. So point is that with low energy penetration, injuries are caused by the sharp edges of the object moving through the body. And so we say the narrow point of contact is likely and possible injury, but with a low energy, the injury won't be as severe as a high energy or significant force. So knives may have been deliberately moved around internally, causing more damage than external wound suggests. So you can just say the person get a stab woman and you're gonna say that it's going straight into the heart or straight to the liver. The person could have twisted that knife deliberately to cause further damage. So again, you have an index of suspicion based on the length of the knife, if you can determine it, and the, the, scale, the characteristics of the knife, the force that was involved, and you use that guide to your index of suspicion and suspect the underlying organs can be damaged. So that's the main thing you need to be looking at. The Calibari weapon. So when we look at the part of the projectile, and the projectile is the object that is causing the penetrating injury. May not be easy to predict the part of it. So the part of it is what we call the trajectory. So the trajectory might not be easy to predict because again we say you can't know for sure pathway inside the body especially with a bullet it can ricochet the type of bullet it can fragment it can tumble so all kind of things can go on inside which we can know for sure but your index suspicion is that you're gonna have a penetrating injury you're gonna have an entrance wound and you're gonna suspect that there can be a exit wound so do your assessment and take those into consideration that possible internal organs are injured. So the part the project shall take is the trajectory. Fragmentation will increase damage. Bullet speed is another factor. So with penetrating injury, the projectile, key thing you need to recognize is characteristic of the object that is causing penetration. So the size of it, the um, in a bullet is the caliber of the bullet. The, 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 the type of weapon is it a high velocity weapon or is like a handgun not so high velocity as a rifle so that will determine we say that the speed or the velocity of the object is directly related to the extent of the damage so again this size of the object matters too and the area of the body that is injured but more so is the speed and you will need what we call cavitation coming up so the speed of the object causing the penetration will generate a pressure wave that enters the body and so you cannot expect injury along the pathway only but you can have injury extending outside of the direct pathway of that projectile and that's what we call cavitation so you can end up having temporary cavitation meaning that the pressure wave extends further out Surrounding organs can be affected by that pressure wave, but after the object has passed, then the um, pressure wave will reduce and that cavitation will come back and end up with permanent cavitation where the pathway is extended into is wider than the actual size of the object that is causing the penetration. So these are things that you need to be, to be mindful of as you look at the penetrating injuries. So, bear that in mind. Okay, so we mentioned the cavitation, so that image there of it. So, 
you will see the bullet enters here and it's coming along building a pressure wave and you see it extending outward and so the further up per cavitation after the bullet pass you can have permanent cavitation directly closer to the which end up remaining after the object has passed that, those are the injuries that are likely from penetrating object and it's all depending speed and that's why the velocity object causing the penetration is directly related to the extent that it so relationship between distance and severity injury varies depending on the type of weapon involved the projectile can be slowed down the bullet can be slowed down because of the air drag so resistance in the it can slow it down and minimize force that it, it has when it's impact the body but area damage by projectile is typically larger than the diameter of a projectile, which we say is from the cavitation, permanent cavitation caused that. And then the energy available for a bullet to cause is more a function of its speed. So you must remember that formula kinetic energy, half mass times velocity squares. If you double the velocity, then you are going to cause the, the um, quadruple or four times it. This is um, some example they give of penetrating trauma. The um, issues that you can get based on the area of the body or the mechanism, you can more at that. All right, but just recognize that different area will, will be impacted and give rise to different signs and symptoms. You can look at that. But um, the key thing we are saying here with the penetrating trauma that characteristic projectile this velocity of the projectile the um, part is the speed of the projectile then the, the term extent of the injury and bear that in mind when you're assessing for these penetrating so another form of trauma we is um blunt injuries um, blast injuries so with a blast injury we normally associate blast injury to explosion, military, war, but nowadays you can find maybe not in our jurisdiction. Other jurisdiction you can have explosion happening in my shipyard. We remember the explosion there who we see where those chemicals stored there were um, exploded, causing how many people to die, and so. You can have these explosions taking place in chemical plants, terrorist attack, that's another big area of explosion happening. Even in Jamaica locally, we can think of the gangs having war and they come with makeshift bombs, mallet cocktail bombs. So whatever the cause of the blast is are what we will be called to deal with. So remember, they are going to have four categories of blast injury. You need to recognize is likely from these blasts or explosions. So you're gonna have what we call a primary blast injury that is directly related to the pressure wave that is generated by the blast. So that pressure wave gonna be impacting directly and persons who are closer to the blast or the explosion. So the closer you are, the more impacted you will be by that pressure wave. And so the more injury will sustain. And this pressure wave will normally affect the hollow organs more than the solid organs. Go ahead, Mr. Cameron. Jan uh, Sir, how would you measure, measure the, 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 the blast, blast range? So it's it's all gonna be dependent on the the type of ex, um, explosive. So it's it's gonna be dependent on the type of explosive. So the size of the explosive, the material that make the explosion. So basically, it's gonna be dependent. But we not you don't necessarily have to calculate it. All we need to know from our side as a EMS provider is that. The further you are, it's going to be less impacted. But 
if you close AR, it can be more impacted. So you're going to be called to a person who has sustained injuries from this blast or explosion. And you must tell yourself that primarily the first line of injury they're going to sustain is from that primary, which is coming directly from the pressure wave emitted by that explosion. So, as I'm saying, hollow organs will be the organs that are affected. They are the most likely organs to be affected. And you think about your hollow organ, your number one is easily damaged by that pressure. And you're looking at your um, lungs, you're looking at your um, intestines, your blood vessels to an extent. So, Primary one, persons expo exposed to explosion, you hear them say that them ears ringing. They, um, you might have minor bleed from the ear. So that's what you're going to be thinking of. The first blast injury is going to be the primary one directly as a result of the pressure wave. The second injury is going to be the secondary injury. And that is coming from whatever material they use to make that bomb are explosive. So some explosive, they have bearings, they have balls, they have nails, they have all type of material in there. When it explodes, all that will be carried by the same pressure wave and sent around. And also, whatever else is in its body, the glass that gets shattered, wood splinters, all of those things will be carried along in that pressure wave and will impact persons, can impact persons, and they are going to cause injury. So that's the secondary blast injury that you can get from an explosion. The tertiary blast injury or the third line of injury that you can get is the pressure wave that gonna throw persons against another object. So you get flung against a building on the ground and you're gonna get injuries from that impact. Again, that's a third line of injury that you can get. Tertiary blast injuries. They have another level. The last level is the miscellaneous or the Quaternary line of injury is the where you have objects falling on you also after the blast occur. Building collapse. You also have um whatever material you use to make the explosion. If it's a um, biological ex material um explosive, then you're gonna have um chemicals toxic fumes that are released also and can impact persons. Persons can suffer from this last line of days, years down the line, based on what material they used to release it. So we, as an EMS provider, you have to be mindful of these injuries that can occur and make sure you look out for these and assess them accordingly. So these are fundamentals that you need to recognize and it will guide you in your assessment of your patient. So we talk about the primary blast due to enter, enter to the blast itself, and we say pressure wave, secondary blast, damage to body, tertiary blast, victim is hurled by the force of the explosion. So make sure you know these, and as you see them when you're assessing a patient, you can recognize what is happening, and it will guide your management of your patient. So the fourth line we say the quaternary miscellaneous blast injuries, burns from hot gases are fired by the blast, respiratory injury inhaling in from inhaling toxic gases, crush injury from the collapse of buildings. So a whole range of injury can come down the line from this blast. And most patients will have some combination of the four types. So a patient can be impacted with all of them. So Bear that in mind as you assess your patient. So organs that contain ear are the most susceptible to pressure changes. So we talk about the middle ear. So the eardrum significant, can be significantly impacted from that pressure wave. The lungs, so your hollow organs, those are the ones that are going to be affected, especially those with ear. So be mindful of that. A person exposed to a blast, you should be thinking right away. So all these injuries are likely, and so you assess and treat a patient accordingly. So the ear is the most sensitive to blast injuries. So the patient will complain of ringing in the ear. They can have um, 
mind of bleeding coming from the ear. So be mindful of that. So pulmonary blast injuries result from short range exposure to the detonation of explosive sleeves. So same pressure wave we say being exerted, causing pulmonary damage, organs to be damaged. So arterial ear embolism can produce disturbances in vision. So this is where we say pressure wave cause ear embolism to be formed in your blood vessel. So you have ear collecting in the blood vessel because of the pressure wave. So it overcomes the pressure of the blood vessel and ear enters the blood vessel. And this can lead to disturbance in your vision, changes in the behavior and state of consciousness, variety of other neurologic signs. So if ear go in the blood vessel to your brain, then you can have significant issues in there. If it goes to your heart, you can have significant issue with there. So you can have um, hyperperfusion to an extent. Be mindful of that. So solid organs are relatively protected from shockwave injuries, but they can also be injured. So also and may be injured by secondary missiles or a pearled bomb. So because not because they are not so susceptible to the pressure wave, but solid organs or the body itself can be injured from the other types that we say. Secondary things that are in the bomb, objects that are picked up by the pressure wave, they can be hurled against the body and the body can be hurled against an object and you sustain injuries. So neurologic injuries and head trauma are the most common causes of death when you have the last injuries. So traumatic amputation are common. So the same pressure wave, the force of it, it's that great that actually amputate our extremity. So that's how significant a blast injury is. So again, it is all about your mechanism of injury, looking at it and suspecting underlying injuries based on what you know about these mechanics of these injuries. And with multi-system trauma, we see is that more than one body system has been impacted and it's going to come directly as a result of significant mechanism of injury. So significant mechanism of injury is associated to significant trauma or injury. And that is where we say more than one body system will be affected, multi-system trauma. So you can have head and spinal trauma, chest and abdominal trauma, chest and multiple extremity trauma. So alert medical control and transport rapidly. So in the field as pre-hospital emergency medical providers, we can do so much for a patient when they are having significant multi-system trauma. They're going to need surgical intervention in most cases. So our job is to treat life, stabilize, package the patient appropriately, and provide safe um, prompt transport because we are going to look at the platinum 10 minutes. You best chance of survival for these patients with these multi-system trauma is done within one hour of their injury. So that's the best chance they have of survival. The compensator mechanism don't work so well after one hour. So whatever we are going to do for them, it should be done within that first hour. And you will hear the term golden hour. It used to be referred to, but now they are using golden period because some injury need less than that hour to be dealt with. So use the term golden period as against golden hour. Within that golden period or golden hour, we in the emergency setting, the pre-hospital setting, have 10 minutes, within 10 minutes to assess, stabilize, treat, package our patient, get them off that scene within that 10 minutes in order to give them maximum chance of survival. So it's very important that you recognize that and look at it. So goal and principle of pre-hospital trauma care, these are your fundamental principles. You must make sure that Seeing safety is a must. So you looked at patient assessment and you would have gone through scene size up. The first thing is not 
else matter unless you are safe, your partner is safe, makes you consider the patient, family member, bystander, go down the line like that. For so your safety come first. If you are not safe, you become injured or God forbid killed, then you become another victim. You are gonna not being able to help that person with the resources that you went with and you need to draw on resources to yourself now, which is gonna deplete it. So make sense you are safe or don't bother going any further. So determine need for additional personnel or equip equipment. So if you need help to get the scene safe, you have to call for those. But next you're gonna evaluate MOI. So we say the second thing in your scene size up after you have ensure that the scene is safe. Whatever means you have to do to make it safe, you get it safe or you don't go into it, then you're gonna look at the MOI. And for other cases, medical case with the NOI, but we are focusing on trauma overview. So you must hit your MOI once you have established that scene is safe. So that's the main thing you're gonna look at because that's gonna give you valuable information to help you as you go forward. So MOI is very important. So after you have determined your MOI, you're gonna look at your standard precaution and with your MOI, we say if this if it's significant, you're gonna suspect spinal injury, suspect multi-system trauma, and you're gonna take a standard precaution, whatever you need to take at that point, dependent on the mechanism of injury. Then you're gonna be looking at number of patients because there is when you might have to call for additional help also from a number of patients. And then you will seek to determine if you can manage that scene. Then you're gonna go to your primary assessment, which is where you're gonna focus on the life threats. So as you're going your primary assessment, life threat is a critical thing. So you're gonna get the patient, check the patient LOC, then you're gonna hit the big item. ABCs. As we said before, three things that can kill the patient immediately. Here we compromise, breathing, not ventilating properly. Circulation is a significant bleeding. Those are the three big things that can kill a patient right away. So you must assess and deal with them. Provide any shock treatment if the patient shows signs of shock. Spinal immobilization, and we say all patients who have significant mechanism of injury gonna suspect some spinal injury like so you're gonna provide for a spinal immobilization and we say that you're gonna have that time that you need to move off the scene package that patient you will do a rapid scan it's significant you're still gonna search the body quickly and determine if there's any other injuries that you need to deal with and then you decide that you're gonna package the patient appropriately fully mobilize in a case of significant mechanism of injury significant multi-system trauma and you're gonna have to provide transportation promptly to the receiving facility. Now there's a way that you need to look at also. So the golden principle of trauma care continues to say that definitive care requires surgical intervention. So we say that a patient with multi-system trauma will eventually need surgical intervention. So we cannot do that unseen. We cannot do that in the pre hospital setting. So it is important for us to recognize that and get them to where they can have it done. And we say the golden hour or the golden period is the first hour after the injury where survival is best, where compensator mechanism can work up to that point. After that, they're going to be diminished. So we have 10 minutes unseen and we call it the platinum 10 to make sure you are assess the patient appropriately, consider MOI, where necessary treatment life threatening treatment needed, stabilize and treat whatever injuries you can and recognize that in your cage and get that patient off the scene. Obtain a sample history where you can and complete your secondary assessment. And so you will do your history taking your vital signs, your focus assessment if it's an isolated injury, if it's a multi-system trauma, you have to do your rapid scan. And again, we say you're gonna consider your AX intercept, which you would have considered from your scene size up, and you're gonna make your determination as to how you're gonna transport the patient. So the key thing is you need to recognize 
you must know your area that you're working in. You must know your protocols and those are what gonna guide you because again we say the golden hour is critical so you need to get your patient as quickly as possible to that era that can provide the best care and so you have the choice in first world country you will have the choice local in in jamaica your choices might be limited but you you're gonna consider ground transportation or air transportation if it's available depending on your patient condition so those are some consideration you will look at, but it's gonna be dependent on the injury that the patient sustain because we are looking at the golden hour and we are looking at the time. But when you consider ground transportation against air transportation, you're gonna consider the factor that to get the air ambulance up, you're gonna need to alert the crew, and you need to the two crew will have to get airborne, they have to fly to the location they might not be able to come exactly to where you are so they have to find a landing zone they have to land and if they are not coming exactly to where you are you'll have to transport the patient to them so all that can take time so you will have to decide if it is worth calling for the air ambulance as against you transporting the patient directly and that's gonna be on the resources you have available in your area and also your protocol so your protocol with the tape but they have some international guidelines which will tell you a certain patient that you would consider for air transport and also you have some patient that will not fit that category but bear that in mind in your decision so that's a decision that you will have to make based on those factors so when a patient experiences a significant mechanism of injury and is critical condition rapidly perform a physical examination so if it is a significant mechanism of injury, we suspect multi-system trauma. So you will have to search the body to find out these underlying injuries. You cannot just deal with the ABCs and say that you finish and package a patient. Patient had trauma to the chest. They can have underlying injuries. They have um, fallen significant height. They can have fractured pelvic. Um, they can have um, broken femur. So you have to search the body and determine rule out those injuries before you can package the patient. So significant mecha mechanism of injury, rapid scan is indicated. When a patient has experienced a non-significant mechanism of injury, then you focus on the chief complaint. So we gave the example earlier on a person have a gunshot wound to the forearm, isolated injury, you still assess him ABC or her ABCs, rule out in a life threat, then you focus on the localized injury so you might not necessarily have to do a rapid scan in that case but it's all about your mechanism of injury whether it is significant or non-significant that's gonna be your guide so disability and unseen injury to the brain may occur when a person has injuries to the head so again from the mechanism of injury you're gonna suspect it even though you might not see any injuries to the external part of the head Based on the mechanism of injury, then we said the third collision can be there. So you suspect the head injury can occur to the brain, and you can look at your patient signs and symptoms. The chart earlier on that we looked at will give you some guide as to those. So bleeding or swelling inside the skull is often life threatening. So even though the skull is not impacted, the brain can have what we call the same compression and tearing. You can have bleeding inside the brain. And so you can have swelling and that can cause the pressure to build up and you can have raised intracranial pressure. So bear that in mind. So include frequent neurological examination in assessment. So you find a patient who is conscious and alert, significant mechanism of injury, significant trauma. All along your assessment, you're gonna be reassessing that person neurological status, check back on the LOC, talk to the patient, reassess the PMS, and make sure there's no neurological defects developing. Because again, we say internal injury can be there and it don't show up immediately and it will become evident as you go along with the patient. It can get worse and the patient condition can deteriorate. So you must stay focused with your assessment. So some patients will not have obvious signs and or symptoms but you have looked at the mechanism of injury and that's where you're going to use that to guide you and recognize 
that even though you're not seeing any signs, you're not patient, not complaining of anything, but from your mechanism of injury, you know that injuries are likely internally, and so you must be careful to watch out for them. So once there is injury to the neck or throat, we are gonna be concerned about the structures that are in the neck and throat. We know that you have the trachea, you have the blood vessels, you have the carotid arteries, you have the jugular vein. So these are structures that are impacted. So here, here of serious or deadly injuries can occur within the neck or the throat. Airway problem may result. So the trachea can be penetrated. Air can be coming out into the subcutaneous area and you can have emphysema on. You can have what we call subcutaneous. Um, you can have crepitus when air go in this under the skin and you can also have ear paralysis. The ear get into the blood vessel. So serious complication can arise there. So look for DCAP DTLS and from your patient assessment, you should all know what DCAP DTLS stand for. So we're looking at deformity, contusion, abrasion, puncture, penetrating wound, burns, tenderness, laceration, swelling. So each region of the body, you're going to be checking for those things. And especially in the neck, you will also check for trachea deviation, jugular vein distension, and we say we might observe or discover crepitus. So very important that you check for these things because they can be likely. So it may prevent blood flow to the brain. So this, this swelling can occur and obstruct flow of the carotid artery, the blood in the carotid artery, and so it can affect the brain. So check your patient and observe for these things and be mindful of them. So if you have penetrating injury to the neck, it may result in ear embolism. You can have crushing injury. May cause the cartilages of the upper ear and larynx to fracture. And we say you must know your anatomy of the body. Because this is what gonna guide you as to what structures are there and how they function. You must know physiology. And this is help will help you with your inner suspicion and how you can expect your patient to present. And when they present in a certain way, you can appreciate what is going on. So it's very important that you know all of these things. So Stay focused and know your fundamentals. With chest injury, again, from your anatomy, you know the structures that are contained within the chest. You have the heart, the lungs, the large blood vessels. So if you have penetrating injury to these structures, then you can expect that those structures can be impacted. And so whether penetrating or blood trauma can impact, they can be impacted. And so many life chest injuries may occur Broken ribs may hinder breathing. You can have um, paradoxical motion. So one side of the chest moving up in inhalation while the side remain down. That's gonna affect breathing. The same broken ribs can end up perforate your lungs or your heart or great vessels. So you can have the vessels them can become torn by the third collagen and also the second collagen forces. So a series of injuries can are likely. You must be mindful of it from your mechanism of injury. Suspect the worst and treat according until you know otherwise. So we talk about any penetrating injury to the head, neck, chest, abdomen are considered significant. So when you have penetrating injury to the chest, you can have what we call open chest wound and so when a person inhale, air can be sucked in if the lungs compromise. And when they exhale, air will be pushed out and you hear that sucking effect. So if untreated, shock or death will develop. So if you have air going into that pure space that we say around the lungs, then you can have air, you can have pneumothorax, and you can have blood in that space, you can have hematorax. When it develop into a tension, then you have tension pneumothorax or tension hema pneumothorax. So you can have that progression. And so just from your mechanism of injury, you can suspect it because you have to recognize that if untreated, then shock and death will result. And most of the time we can do the ultimate treatment. 
they're gonna need surgical intervention so all we can do is treat the live check and stabilize and package them appropriately and transport within platinum 10 minutes and assess men should include your decap btls so you're gonna do the rapid scan and as a focus you must ensure you listen to because that's gonna give you an indication of diminished lung sound suggesting that lungs collapse so the, some airflow issue and chest rise and fall will indicate whether you have impartial motion or their they can have damage to their diaphragm which is there also the ribs cage can be damaged and so it will affect the chest rise and and that is ventilation issue so you have to be mindful of these injuries and make sure assess and treat your patient appropriately as it relates to the abdominal injury you know from anatomy that there are several structures in the abdomen again it is all dependent on what quadrant of the abdomen has been impacted but it contains vital organs that require a very high amount of blood flow solid organs include the liver spleen pancreas kidneys you have the hollow organs such as the stomach large and small intestine and urinary bladder so if a person have contusion to the right upper quadrant then from your anatomy then you know that the liver is there so suspect that the force that caused that contusion could have caused further damage to that liver and intestine in that region so that's how you're gonna look at your mechanism of injury index of suspicion and assess and treat of patient so you can have solid organs made tear lacerate or fracture and that can give rise to severe bleeding uh, these organs most of them are vascular liver especially very vascular so significant bleeding can come from your spleen those are vascular organs so you must think of severe internal pain can occur hollow organs may rupture and leak toxic digestive chemicals so with the hollow organs is not a matter of bleeding not um blood loss but it is the toxic chemicals that they have they are released in the abdomen and that's what gives you the peritonitis so that's the danger with those hollow organs being ruptured and you can have large blood vessels the descending aorta pass through there you have the vena cava so those large blood vessels can become ruptured and so you'll have serious bleeding so part of your assessment once you're assessing the abdomen you should check for pulse so you either look or you feel for it because if the aorta rupture then it's gonna pulsate in rhythmic pulsation when the heart contracts so look for that also so we are looking at management so transport and destination are some key issues that you will have to take into consideration i mentioned them before so your scene time is gonna be limited we say to your platinum 10. so survival of critical injured trauma patient is time dependent we mentioned the golden tira the golden hour that's when the chance of survival is best for the patient compensator mechanism can work well up to that point after that they start to deteriorate so your time must be kept to 10 minutes to get that patient assessed stabilized deal with any live threat really and be off that scene within 10 minutes that's what we are aiming for with our significantly uh, mechanism patient so critical injured patient dangerous mechanism of injury which will result in multi-system trauma they're gonna be having le decreased level of consciousness likely and so threat to airway breathing circulation so any patient that has any of these airway breathing circulation compromise level of consciousness affected dangerous mechanism of injury these are we say significant patient high priority patient so they must leave that scene within that 10 minutes that's your goal so whatever you do you're not pick them up without doing what you need to do you will treat and stabilize life check you will package them appropriately you will do your rapid make sure you cover all the bases and then you need to get them off that scene so how you're gonna transport them is what you need to decide and where you're gonna go with them that's another key factor because it don't make sense you're trying to make sure you cut down the time as best as possible so if 
air transport is available and they fit the criteria, then you're going to go with air transport. Again, like we said, know what is available in your region and know your protocol. That's what's going to guide you. And also it says that ground EMS units are staffed by EMTs and paramedics. So again, local jurisdiction Jamaica, you're not going to have paramedics coming out. Official advance authorized. So it's basically a BLS service going to come. You might can call for another about BLS unit, but it depends on your protocol. So if your company might send out the, might send the medical director to come and assist you and but more than likely, you'll have to get that patient to the ALS care and the surgical care that they need. So here, EMS units are staffed with critical care paramedics and nurses. So that's where you can benefit from a ear transport. So the patient is critical and we say they need the intervention. The ear ambulance can come or the ear transport can come with personnel that can do more for that patient unseen than the basic. EMP can do so that's a consideration when you're gonna decide whether to call for it so it's not only the time to get them to the appropriate facility but if you can get some help to them that will help them along the way then you're gonna call that into consideration when you're making your decision so it's about they come up with this guideline so they have some international guideline which they have come up with as it relates to ear transport so these are things that you're going to look at that will decide to make your call for the ear transport. If the period of access to the patient is long, so the patient in a motor vehicle accident and trapped, and the time to excrete the patient is going to take you outside of the 10 minutes we talk about, then to make sure you get the best help within that same golden period, then you might consider ear transport. But again, like I say, it's all dependent on how long are you going to take for the team to uh, mobilize to get the air ambulance up in there and get to you? We are going to land. All of that going to be taken into consideration. So again, but that's a guideline. If the time for execution is long or you take long to reach a patient, then you try to minimize the time by if you have air transport available, that's the guideline. So you can call that, that. But again, you should try to make the decision as early as possible. So from a reach on the scene, even from you get the call, sometimes you can make the determination because you, the quicker you call for the air transport, better for you. Better to call and then you say, all right, we know better need it. And you take too long and then when you call, it's going to take a longer time. So patients need ALS care and no ALS level ground ambulance services available. So if you have a situation like that, like we say, the air transport going to come most cases with advanced personnel. That can do more for the patient so if you think you can you need that then again it's about balancing it multiple trauma patients so this is to say that multiple trauma case mass casualty scene several patients to go to the hospital within there then if you have air transport then you can move some of the patient to another hospital further down the line so that's a reason why it called for the air transport mass casualty the same thing multiple patient so you need to one hospital which is near to you overwhelmed. So if you get air transport, then you can move them still within the hour that we're talking about to give them the best chance of survival. So in terms of the destination that you must take your patient to, there is a decision that is made that they have classified the facilities based on four levers. So you can have level one, level two, Level three, level four facilities are hospital or trauma centers. So these are the, once you have a trauma patient, then you are going to look to get them to one of these trauma centers. If it's a significant mechanism of injury, multi-system trauma, significant trauma, then you're going to look to take them to a level one facility. So out of the four levels, level one is the best level that will have all the capabilities to do everything for your trauma so all aspects will be there. They'll be able to provide all the surgical intervention. They'll have general surgeon there. They will have specialist surgeon there. They will have orthopedic surgeon. They will have thoracic surgeon. They'll have neurosurgeon. So they'll be able to provide all the care. They will have um, rehabilitation procedure can be done there also. 
So that's a level one facility, and you will find these facility at built up era. So the island capital in Kingston, you'd have trauma um, level one trauma center, KPH, U UAWI. So in the built up era, you'll have the level one facility. Next to the level one, you'll have level two facility, which you'll have at the outskirts of the built up era. So they have almost the same capability as a level one, except that they might not go all the range of rehabilitation and also prevention technique, but they should have the same general surgeon, the same basic, um, the same intervention that is needed for all of the injuries a patient can have in terms of trauma. And so the choice is to head towards level one first, but if you have a decision to make between a level three that is closer to you and a level one, level two that is closer to you and a level one that is very far, then you can still go to the level three and expect to get most of the care that you would get at the level. So it says that to be located in less populated density provide initial definitive care. So the difference there is initial definitive care, but the level one would give you a comprehensive here so you could you will get a more comprehensive care at the level one but the level two will provide care that you need for your patient most of the care that you need for your patient just the same so the level three now is a step down you will not get the optimum care that you would need for your patient at level three so a level three provides assessment resuscitation emergency care and stabilization transfer patient to level one or level two facility when necessary. So it's like you're gonna stop at the level three to get some stabilization in a patient and then they will have to have some facility in place, some provision in place to transfer the patient to the level one or level two. So it's, it's like you're stopping to just get some stabilization and move along. But if you have the device, depend on the distance, they, they normally say that if you have to over 20 to 25 for the facility, they can consider the ear ambulance also. But if you don't have any ear ambulance available and you have a choice between the level one and the level two, further away and you have a level three near, then you still want to go to the level one or level two. But if your patient condition deteriorate along the way, then you will have to stop at a level three and get the stabilization that you need for the patient and then Either you move on with the patient afterward or they will have to arrange for that transfer. But that is what you're aiming at. Level one is the ultimate for our multi-system trauma, patient significant trauma. So level four is the lowest level. So level four is like at a, a clinic. So you, you normally have these facility at remote areas, you know, where there is no other, hard to forget the standard facility level one, two or three, and the amount of people there maybe not warrant it. But they have these remote outposts, as you would call it. So you can still go there and get some care, but you're not gonna get more than likely they might not even have a day there. They might have a, a nurse, you know, so you will just get the basic. So it provides advanced trauma life support. So that's what you there. So that's the least one you'd want to go with a trauma patient that is significant. And also they categorize the trauma facility as adult and pediatric trauma center. So if you have an adult patient, your aim is to go to an adult trauma center. If you have a pediatric patient, trauma patient, then you're gonna try to reach to a pediatric trauma center if there's one available. If there's no pediatric trauma center available, then you have no choice but to go to the adult trauma center. But normally, you sometimes you will have areas that they have them separate, so that's what patient appropriately. So as you look at your transport decision and your destination, trauma centers we say are categorized as either adult centers or pediatric, and so do not transport a pediatric patient to an adult trauma center when there is a pediatric one available, because you're gonna do the best pediatric patient when you can get them to that facility. So again, they're going to give you some guidelines here as to how you make the decision for the levels that you go to. And all you need to recognize is that once the mechanism is significant, then you're going to know that you have to take your patient to a level one 
trauma center. That's your aim, that's your goal. But again, it's gonna be dependent on the facility that you have in your region. So in Jamaica setting, if you are in Negril and you have a motor vehicle accident and you respond and you have that patient, then you're gonna be looking at going to Savlamar Hospital. So some region you don't have any choice. You are limited in your choices. So you have to work with what you have. And again, your protocol will guide you. But that's how you're gonna look at the range. And you can look at that chart and see how it goes down the line. If it's not significant, then you will go down where you can go to a level three and so forth. But you can look at that time. So we are looking at transport decision. So special consideration. You need to remain calm. So if you go on a scene, motor vehicle accident, you see significant damage to the vehicle, you're gonna have your index of suspicion that significant damage can be done to the injury can be done to the patient. Don't get frustrated and have a tunnel vision. Like we say, don't just think of it as our own think of it that it can be medical also. Do your assessment. So organize yourself and do your complete assessment. Don't skip your scene size up and go straight to primary and compromise yourself in that scene. Go to your scene size up. And make sure you ensure the scene is safe. You have your MOI critically. Critical thing to ensure you check and know, protect your, know the number of patients and so that you can manage and you go forward. Then you have to make sure that in your primary assessment, the first thing you're going to look at Check your patient LOC and then you're gonna look at live check, ABCs. Make sure the patient have a patent airway. Make sure your patient is ventilating adequately. Make sure you control all bleeding. Make sure you have done that. If there is significant bleeding, exsanguinating bleeding, then that's when they say you can skip the airway and breathing and go straight to control that bleeding. If it's not exsanguinating, not excessive bleeding, then you focus on your airway breathing first. But at the end of the day, we as emergency medical providers don't want to cause any more harm, do no further harm. Our aim is to stabilize the patient as we see them and try to improve on their condition. Their condition can deteriorate and we don't have any control, but don't cause deliberate harm. So never hesitate to contact ALS backup or medical control or guide or remember, you have to in order and it will guide you. It will meet some situation and we are talking about special consideration. And every case will be unique. You are giving the guy, you are being here, but when you go out in the field, you're gonna be encountering situation that you know you hear about, you know, talk about in the textbook or in class. So you will have to assess each scene and make your determination. And when you're standing order to cover a situation, make sure you call for medical control and let them guide you. Along also with the transport decision, we say that you have to make your protocol guide. You. The destination of choice will also be guided also by your protocol and if needs be, you'll get further in instruction. But also from the scene, you can think about your ALS backup, but like we say, it's related to your jurisdiction. So Jamaica, chances are you won't get any ALS coming to you. So you'll have to make sure you get the patient to the ALS and to the definitive surgical care that they need. So it's very important that you bear that in mind. So we have come to the end of the trauma overview presentation. Um, a lot of information and I'm sure it can be overwhelming, but I hope you have grasped the main points. If there is any question quickly before we go into lunch break. Any questions? Any question? Any questions?
Every, everything clear? Is everything clear? That's a question. We need a response. Yes, okay. Yes, have... Everything is clear. Yes, sir. Go ahead, um, Mr. Russia. It's quite a bit of information, but um, there's a general understanding. Well, on my end. Okay, Miss Rochelle, you had a question? Okay, um, what do we refer to as a platinum 10? What's the platinum 10? as it relates to trauma. Mr. Wilson. So, sir, these are the first, um, within the first 10 minutes, we are able to properly assess the patient, um, treat all life-threatening issues with the patient, also prep them for transport if necessary. OK. Um, Okay, um, so as I said, it's a lot of information and um, I hope you can process it and you read over, make sure that it's sinking, make sure you get the concepts and I will close for now and I'll hopefully I'll come back for another session and just keep the focus so it's lunchtime. All right.